ahead. I want to bring in Greg Fleming, president and CEO of Rockefeller Capital Management. He, of course, is the former president of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management and was in the middle of the 2008 uh, financial crisis at Merrill Lynch when he helped orchestrate that transaction uh, with Bank of America. It's nice to see you. Good to see you, Andrew. Kelly, good to um, be here. So what do you think? Where are we? What, is it, what do you think about the, where we are in this crisis right now, if, if we are in one? Well, you know, uh, people ask me about deja vu uh, on, on multiple topics, and there are some things that uh, are similar to 08, and then there's some major differences. And first of all, at a macro level, I think that uh, this is not, I mean, 08 was a much bigger event with the, all the credit problems and ultimately probably hundreds of billions of dollars written off on, on, on credit assets, uh, you know, on the credit side of the equation. Um, uh, before that was up, and, and this is not that. This is right. more, I mean, we have a Fed that has uh, raised rates uh, at, at a record pace historically and, and the amount, and that's created this asset liability mismatch at, uh, at so many different banks, and, and, and that's really what's going on now. So it's a, different, it's a different game this time. There are many similarities. I have to say, Andrew, from a personal standpoint, when I get the deja vu question, uh, nobody knows this more than you because you had the treatise on, and, and the well, book you read. At Merrill, I was right. in the middle of it. Uh, when we built Rockefeller, we wanted to build it around advice. And I remember all of those town halls at Merrill where I'm talking to advisors and people across the firm about proprietary trading right. and derivatives and risk. So at Rockefeller, we're not a bank. Right. Uh, we don't match assets and liabilities. We are a safe haven for clients but and assets, and that's different for me. But having lived through it and seen what now the Fed and the Treasury Department has, has done, do you say to yourself, the dominoes have stopped. Do you think this implicit guarantee on deposits is implicit, explicit, and it won't be tested, will be tested, but it will work? Yeah. What, what's going to happen here? Well, first of all, I think the, the government and the administration did a good job last weekend with what they needed to do uh, to, uh, to, to, to start to get through this. And, and, and there was the whole TikTok around the weekend, and you all know this. Right. I mean, what was similar to 08 was everybody uh, in the know last weekend wondering, will the government act and will they go far enough? So they did a good job stepping in on Monday on insured and uninsured deposits and on the, the banks that were at issue. You know, for me, I'd like to see it go further now, and maybe they're going to need Congress for this, and that becomes an issue. But, uh, and you uh, think they're going to need Congress for which part? For the, for, for, we have about 17 or $18 trillion in, in bank deposits across the economy. About 55 percent are insured. The cap now is $250,000 per account. I think that what should happen from a legislative standpoint now is they should insure deposits. And across you can the board. Across Cor the board. Corporate. Well, you, you, you know, you might have a ceiling, consumer. Consumer, a ceiling at some level, but you can price it. You could, you could charge more for deposits in, in a riskier deposit model. And then you'd have, uh, first of all, from an FDIC standpoint, if you go the rest of the way there, you're not going to have bank runs anymore. You're, you're, you know, the FDIC right. won't have to be tapped because... You won't have, you won't this. have any bank runs, but then do you add into the equation how do you deal with the, not just the moral hazard, but the potential risk taking by the banks who say to themselves, you know what, I have no risk anymore. Yeah, but, but, but you know, let's talk about that moral hazard for a second. Whose moral hazard is it? I mean, if there's moral hazard, uh, wouldn't it be the bank that has all insured deposits that would have the greatest uh, incentive to go take risk? And that's not what's happened here. In fact, what you know, what's also similar to 08 is the hunting in the market for who's the most weak next. Right. And, and the proxy's been uninsured deposits. So you could take that out of the system and you could price it. You could price those deposits. If you have a, a model that seems to be more aggressive uh, from a bank standpoint, then the FDIC could say, we're going to charge more for those deposits. You have a higher percentage of deposits above a million dollars, above 10. And you could set a ceiling. 50 or $100 million. But the bottom line is, you know, what's happening to a lot of these banks today, and, the, and of course the rating agencies right. jump in now, and they say, wait, you have deposit risk, so now the institution has, you know, more, you know, bigger challenges. That was another parallel to 08. The rating agencies...